name is Joshua Kirst. I'm the preaching pastor here at Disciples Church. I want to welcome you if you're here visiting. Um, God is good. What a great time to, to sing his praises, uh, to exalt his holy name. Grab your Bibles with me and uh, open to the letter of James. If you're just joining us and are new to the scriptures, you'll find it towards the back of your Bible after the book of Hebrews and before the letter of 1 Peter. Um, if you uh, need sermon note outline or a Bible to work with, as Marilyn mentioned earlier, we have them there in the back. Um, is, is our lighting correct? Or is it just my eyes? There we go. I'm just going, I just must be very tired because you all look a lot darker than normal. <laughs> Today I'm going to preach James chapter 5, verse 13 through 15. In a sermon that I've titled, Faith at Work in Prayer, Part 1. I'm going to preach Part 2 of this passage next week as we focus next week on verses 16, 17, and 18 in this important concluding section of James' letter. Uh, we're winding down this great journey through this letter uh, in this sermon series that we're calling Faith at Work. The call to prayer is a common way to conclude a New Testament letter. Uh, we see this in Romans 15, 30 through 32, Ephesians 6, 18 through 20, Philippians 4, 6, Colossians 4, 2 through 4, 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 and 25, 2 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 2, and Hebrews 13, 18 through 19. James follows this important trend with a strong press to pray in this closing section of his letter. And I pray that our study um, today, next week together, uh, would equip us with a growing prayer life, um, that our faith would be at work in prayer. And so as we dive into God's good word this morning, will you pray with me? Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. You are to be praised and exalted and trusted, Lord God. Lord, that we would be people of faith. That we would be people who have died to sin, selfishness, and given new life to what is God-honoring and righteous. To a journey of sanctification and maturity and growth together. I thank you for the body of Christ, how sweet it is to be part of this adopted family. Uh, we thank you for your um, enduring and, and, and your faithfulness in this church, First Baptist Church of Bakersfield, and approaching our 130th year of ministry here in Bakersfield. And this sweet new beginning we have in this new location and campus, um, the rebirth you've really taken us through, and reformation and refining. God, you, you and I, um, you know, Lord, I've just been praying a lot this week and continue to pray in this moment for each person you've ordained to be here today, uh, that you would move us and shape us, that we would be so hungry to be obedient to your word, uh, to, uh, to trust you with all of our lives. We love you and we thank you for this time you've provided Move mightily in and through us, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. James chapter 5, verse 13. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. First, consider with me what kind of suffering does James have in mind here? Is it physical? Is it mental? Is it spiritual? I think it's all of these. According to the context of the letter, James is writing to Jewish believers who have been forced from their home. They're dispersed. We see that in the opening verses of the letter. They're receiving persecution from the ranking Jews, uh, from an oppressive pagan culture, mistreatment uh, that has been identified from the wealthy it only makes sense that James would make it a priority to commission the believers to the practice of prayer in light of their afflictions. 
in their dispersion. And simply by being followers of Jesus in a world that hates Jesus. There are many ways we today can relate to this. Um, The sinful workings in our culture all around us. The the priorities of a lost society. The the persecution and battle against righteousness and, and what honors God. There are so many ways that we are, as Peter defines, elect exiles. Whatever suffering you are going through, whatever hardship that you are facing lately, um, I pray that you would lean in and hear the counsel of James today to pray. That we grow in this practice of prayer, this priority of the Christian life, that God is trusted and honored by our faithfulness and our lives live for him. In the coming verses, we're going to see James prescribe three kinds of prayer that believers are to practice and or be benefited by as their faith is at work. In verse 13 here, personal prayer. We're going to see elder prayer highlighted in verse 14 and 15. And then prayer for one another. We'll focus in on next week in verse 16. We will also see James focus on the power of prayer and the purpose of prayer. In these coming verses, again, he says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Why do we pray, church? Why do we go to God in the midst of our struggle? We pray, number one, because his word calls us to. Philippians 4, 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. In everything, we are to pray. To not worry, but to pray. I've had to exercise this verse many times this week. To put off what the flesh wants to stress about and worry about and to go to God in prayer. We pray because God wants us to talk to Him, to do life with Him. Think about how present God is in every aspect of your daily life and yet how little we often acknowledge Him in prayer throughout our day. He is so very present. And yet, how many days, how seldom I really acknowledge his presence and talk to him in prayer. Think about the fact that the God of the universe hears you when you're alive in Christ, saved and sanctified by his blood. He wants to hear you. He wants to hear from you. Just as a loving father wants to hear from his children, wants them to come to him and walk and talk with him, all the more our holy God does too. In John's first letter, 1 John 5, 14-15, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we will have the request that we have asked him for. We pray because his word calls us to. We pray because God is all-powerful. Why would we not go to the one who is all-powerful in any given situation? Jeremiah 32, 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Matthew 19, 26, Jesus looked at them and said, What is with man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. 
why would we not go to the one who holds all things in his hand? To trust him. To rest in him. Church, we pray because God is the source of peace and help and comfort and healing. 2 Corinthians 1, 3-4 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Peter says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. Oh, how we need to pray. Let us be people who pray. The present tense of the verb translated, let him pray, points to a continual praying to God. It's not just a a one-time thing and then you're done, you've checked the box. No, it's a continual bringing it to him. Paul agrees, gives us the same counsel in his letters with some bold exhortation. He says in 1 Thessalonians 5.17, pray without ceasing. It comes back to the point I was making a moment ago about the always present activity of God in every moment of your life, in every thought. He's not distant. He's not turned away. He's present. And that we would walk and talk with him. Acknowledging his holy presence. It is a better view of this that will help us to pray without ceasing. One of the ways you can pray without ceasing is to help yourself by removing the formality of it. Some people will say, man, it's really hard for me to pray without ceasing in all my busy day. And and that's because you have leveled formalities on your prayer life that don't have to be there. Thinking about having to stop everything you're doing to dial him up and then have, say what you need to say or do what you need to do and wrap it up and hang up the phone and then go back to your doing and your life and your days. And so in that kind of view, it makes sense why we would feel too busy. But he doesn't need those formalities to hear us, and we don't need them to talk and walk with him. Father God, thank you for every person sitting before me today. What a blessing it is to be together, to be in your word today. You're a good God. Even in this very moment, in the middle of the sermon, just bring your truth, bring conviction. Love you, Lord. I mean, just, and just right in the middle of it all. Right in the middle of it. Seeing someone walk up to you just, just to pray, God, let me be a blessing to this person right now. As, as they walk away, Lord, as I walk into this meeting, as I turn this corner, Father, you're a good God. I love you. I'm yours. You're at work in this. We would just pray without ceasing. Think, church, about how we would fight sin if we were all the more just walking and talking with God in this way. But instead, we're we're guilty of packaging him and putting him away and containing him in our Sunday mornings and our Wednesday nights and our our morning devotions or our mealtime prayers or our whatever. You know, if there's an emergency, break glass kind of prayers. Let, let, remove the formalities. Yeah, pray at the meal, pray during the meal, pray after the meal. Let's pray without ceasing. Ephesians 6.18, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. At all times is pretty clear. 
Jesus emphasizes our, our need to pray day and night. In a parable, he told his followers in Luke 18, 1 through 8, he told them a parable to, to the effect that they ought to always pray and not lose heart. He said in a certain city, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect man, Yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. And will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Church, we need to be regular in prayer. A few things this does for us when we're regular in prayer. Number one, it helps us keep hope alive. When you stop praying, it is a sign that you are losing or have lost hope that God is still going to work in that situation. Number two, it will, remain a, it will maintain a willingness in you to be led by Him and His timing. When you stop praying, often you stop praying because you kind of believe you've learned everything there is to know about that situation or what's been done is done. Maybe we think God's not willing to act. So we just give up. Number three, constant prayer will guard us from sin. Because when we're going to God, we're not looking for something on the horizontal to be our answer. We're looking for God to be our answer. And sometimes when we stop praying, then we start looking for an answer on the horizontal in our flesh, and oftentimes what that looks like then is sin. When we trust God, we don't take things in our own hands. We obey His word. We trust His counsel. When we stop praying, often that can lead to more fleshly activity. The words of the classic hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, are so helpful to remind us to bring everything to God in prayer. Those of you who've been around the church for a while might remember this one. Let me give you a couple stanzas. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. What needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrows share? Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. What is prayer? According to our Word of Truth Catechism, question 102. What is prayer? The answer is prayer is a pouring out of our hearts to God in praise, thanksgiving, confession of sin, expressing our request to Him while submitting to His sovereign will. Prayer is communicating with God the Father through God the Son, Jesus Christ, by the power of God the Holy Spirit. Prayer is less about getting God to do what we want Him to do, and more about getting ourselves reoriented to doing what God wants or has for us. I really want you to hear that. So I'm going to say that a couple different ways. Because I really think, in large part, we look at prayer through really a misguided angle. Prayer is our opportunity to acknowledge that He's the source 
that we are dependent on Him. Prayer is less about getting God to do what we want and more about us joining God in what He's going to do. And yet how counter is that to often what we think about our prayer life? I'm going to take this to God in prayer. And a lot of times it's, here's what I want, here's what I need here. Lord, will you please do this? And and it's less about what it should be about is, Lord, help me see this and address this or wait on this according to your perfect will for your perfect purposes. When you pray, why you pray, so often it's just this constant pleading with God to do it our way. But oh, how it should be, we should be far more motivated to pray so that we're joining Him in what He's doing or not going to do. Trusting Him, yielding to Him. Prayer is our opportunity to recognize God is in control. It is that much needed reorientation for our hearts throughout our day to not make it about us and what we want to make us about Him and what He wants. Submitting to that control is to ask for things. We are to ask for things. The Scriptures are clear. With the understanding and the peace that the outcome is His, to decide, and ultimately what he decides is what's best for his glory and our joy. And we trust that. We need to remember that God's will is not always our will. That when we pray for God's will to be done, we shouldn't be trying to manipulate him into rubber stamping what we've already decided to do. If we notice how James has spoken of trials and sufferings in previous verses of his letter, James 1, 2 through 4, James 5, 7 through 11, I would say his, his prayer is not so much that the suffering is necessarily removed, but is for endurance and resounding faith in and through the suffering that he might ordain. Church, the goal is that our faith would remain at work and our prayer life would assist that. I would say that this is much of the aim of our faith at work in prayer. God, do your mighty and perfect work in and through me in this suffering. Use me, Lord, for your purposes. Help me to join you in what you're doing or what you're going to do. To live according to your word. Jesus modeled this for us so well in this most, most amazing moment in his journey. The fully God, fully man, Christ while the, while the divine is resolved through and through, his flesh, in his flesh, he, his flesh doesn't want to be mocked and beaten and have his flesh torn off and suffer the slow death on a criminal's cross. But rather than demanding his way, rather than removing himself from the counsel of his word and doing it his way according to the flesh, he prays. Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Luke twenty-two forty-two. So back to James five thirteen. The the rest of verse thirteen gives those who are experiencing the opposite of suffering a similar call to recognize the work of God and to trust Him and to praise Him for He is good and mighty to be praised. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. 
The word cheerful denotes a person who is in good cheer. Uh, They're happy and glad. There's a, a positive headspace that they're in in their current daily life and routine. This wording in the Greek is really more about the emotions of joy and not necessarily the situations of favor. The word used here is less about their circumstances and more about their mental or emotional countenance. The Greek word for praise here is the word used throughout Scripture. It's the, it's the word psalm, meaning to sing praise. Why is singing psalms, praises to the Lord, so important for us? Number one, it reminds us of who we live for. Number two, it reminds us that God is on the throne. Amen? It reminds us who God is and that He's worthy of our faith and our worship. We are to be people of praise for our good God, not just on Sundays, but every day and all the time. Colossians 3, 16-17 Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching it and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Let's move forward. Look with me at verse 14. James 5, 14. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him. The Greek word used here for sick is used 18 times in the New Testament to speak of physical ailments. The same word is also used 14 times to speak of emotional or spiritual weakness. James says, let the sick person call for the elders to pray. This is because the elders are some of the most mature in faith among the flock and therefore faithful to pray and to lead people to the feet of God in all situations. Uh, Are the elders' prayers more potent than the sheep's prayers? No. So we need to not play that game. But they're faithful to pray to go to God, to reorient the person in all these good ways. The practice of prayer is a big priority for elders, for the shepherds of the flock. In Acts 6, we read that the elders appointed deacons to help do the hands-on work of serving in the ministry, tending to the widows and others, so that the elders could remain devoted to the work of leading the flock in teaching and prayer. This is a high call. It's an important call that the elders in some ways are, are only to do and need to do well specifically. It's not that some of the practical, pragmatic ministry is not for us to also have a hand on at the right times, but that this priority would be lived out. So in Acts 6.4, the elders proclaimed, we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. I mean, just yesterday, um, I've, I've had a uniquely tough and long week that put me behind in finishing my sermon. And so I'm hardly ever writing and, and finishing on Saturday, but that was needed this week. And so I woke up early Saturday morning and kissed my babies and came down to the office to, to meet a few of our faithful members and some of our young uh, men here uh, who were outside my window digging holes in the ground to finish part of our campus build, the patio that's outside my office. How easy it could be for them to go, why are you in there where it's warm while I'm out here digging in the cold rain? Unless they understand that the priority for my life is not to have a shovel in my hand, but to be facing the word and in prayer as my first priority. I wasn't home wrestling with the kids. I was working. Uh, but uh, it was just, it was a cool moment to kind of see that at work. The reality of that. Thankful for you guys who were out there. It was cool to see you enjoy each other's company in that service. 
This remains an important priority, church, on the elders today. You don't want your elders busy with the things that distract us from faithful study and teaching of the word and praying for and protecting the saints entrusted to our care. Does this mean the, that only the elders are the ones who should come and pray for you? It does not mean that. If that's your expectation on us, uh, the schedule might be a while before we get to you. There's three of us and there's hundreds of you. <laughs> Growingly so. Sometimes we will... Um, Uh, Let me say this first. Uh, This is why it's essential that you are gracious in your expectations of how your elders accomplish their ministry to you in prayer. Sometimes that will be in person, and sometimes it will be through the faithful work of an under-shepherd or a brother or sister in Christ on our behalf. We will see next week that James emphasizes the ministry of prayer of the saints as well. I will tell you that the elders at Disciples Church are committed to pray. At the same time, if you asked every one of us, we would be quick to say that we're always wanting to grow in this area. We love to pray for you, our church members, for our city and our nation and our world. Um, We do this in many ways. Uh, We have daily prayer, not only on our own, but together, efforting to start our day to pray together. Weekly prayer for requests and praises that you submit on Sunday mornings. Not only do I ask you not to waste the paper that we made the communication card on, um, but that you would put pen to paper and share with us how can we be praying for you. Um, Praises that you have. Yeah, it's okay those papers come out now in the middle of the sermon. Go ahead, write those down. We really cherish that opportunity to be praying and praising God with you for what he's doing. We have weekly prayer in our meetings as we meet weekly, and constant prayer for you all who are interacting with and sometimes uh, in person with you here at church or maybe in your home or elsewhere. I want our church to be a people, when you interact with us, that you get prayed for. How often do you have an interaction with someone and you walk away and go, I wish I would have prayed for them. I'd love for that to be less and less of the thing we're saying. Because more and more of the time, if God ordains that you come into my path, or I get on the phone with you, that I would pray with you. And that we'd be known for that. And that starts with us as elders doing that more and more and modeling that for you. Look with me at the next part of this verse. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with the oil In the name of the Lord. The Greek word for anointing here describes anointing one's head with oil. This is not a medicinal treatment, as oil was often used back in the day as one of the few things that would medically be helpful, physically be helpful. Uh, It's not seen in that way here. You would call on someone else to do that if that's what you needed. That's not what's intended here. What's also not intended is that this is coming to some kind of spiritual ceremony whereby God's power is put into the oil as maybe you might see faith healers try to use it in that way today. It's also not that. It, it was a tangible sign of affection and blessing in Scripture and, and in that day. We see uh, this in the woman anointing Jesus' body in Mark 16, and Mary's anointing the Lord's feet in John 11 and 12. In Luke 7, 46, Jesus rebuked his host for not anointing his head with oil, but pointed out that the known sinner among them anointed his feet with ointment. She showed more favor and blessing to Christ than they did. So again, the Lord didn't need um, the, the power of God to be more upon him, or, or to be healed through the use of the oil, it, it, it largely serves as, again, a tangible sign of affection and blessing. In Psalm 23, 5, David says, Of the good shepherd, you anoint my head with oil. In this, David is speaking of the care Jesus has for him. It's a sign that God is blessing his life, that God's hand is upon him, 
that God's anointing is upon him is what's being proclaimed here. One of the origins of anointing comes from a, a, a pragmatic practice of the shepherds. Lice, ticks, and other insects would often get into the wool of the sheep. And when they got near the sheep's head, they could burrow into the sheep's ears and make them sick and even kill the sheep. So to be a blessing, the shepherd would make a mixture of olive oil and anoint the head of the sheep, rubbing it into the wool and especially around the nose and the eyes and the ears. From this anointing became a a symbolism of blessing, of protection, Additionally, in Bible times, people were anointed with oil to signify God's blessing or God's hand on that person's life. In the Old Testament, to be anointed by God was to be uh, chosen by Him. A person was anointed for a special purpose in different settings, to be a king or a prophet. One of the most famous occurrences of being anointed is back in the, uh, the story of the author of Psalm 23, David, when David was anointed, called to be king. Samuel sent by God to Jesse's house where the, he was told the next king was to be chosen. First Samuel 16, 11 through 13. Then Samuel said to Jesse, all your sons are here. And he said, there remains yet one, the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, send him and get him for we will not sit down until he comes here. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy and had beautiful eyes and was handsome and the Lord said arise anoint him for this is he then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of the brothers and the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward so we need to see church clearly that there is not power in the oil it stood as a physical sign of God's hand on the faithful It was a way that the culture, in that culture, that people showed care. Or in this instance, James is speaking of how the elders would remind the believer who is sick that God, that they are in God's grip. It was a way to stir faith as a symbol used in that day. Now since then, since uh, these Bible times, when the scriptures were written, the Roman Catholic Church took this practice and ran with it in many of the wrong ways that the Roman Catholic Church has done this. They formalized it, making it an official sacrament of the church called extreme unction that only the priest can do, acting as another way the church had control over the ministry in extra-biblical ways. The reformers, Calvin and Luther, agreed that this practice of anointing and any spiritual gifting to heal were confined to the apostle, uh, to the apostolic age. So the specialness of the oil doesn't have meaning today. This is why the use of oil is not necessary still today. Not that you couldn't use it, as long as someone is not attributing power to it or declaring somehow that the prayers that follow the anointing of oil would be more powerful than if not. That would be a wrong use of it. The emphasis here is not the anointing of the oil, but the truth that's meant to be conveyed to the person who's sick. The role of the elders then, and still is today, to reorient the spiritually struggling or the physically sick person to gospel truth. To remind them who they are in Christ. To speak the truth of the gospel or to speak scripture is a way we do this today. The use of encouragement and scripture to reorient the believer to who they are in Christ. And the fact that God has his hand on them is still needed. James says that the elders are to do this in the name of the Lord. This is how we are to be reminded that it is God's power at work in these moments of care and prayer. In no way do we wield the power. I'm a representative of the Lord. I call upon the Lord. It is God and His glory is the reason why we care for and pray for each other. 
Let's not lose sight of the fact that prayer is the emphasis in these closing verses. So look with me at verse 15 as we continue. The, the, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. While this might sound like the prayer someone says when they are repenting of their sin and trusting in Jesus at salvation... That is not what this is referencing. It is most simply a prayer made in faith. The highlight is that the prayers are made full of faith. Not doubting God, not second guessing Him, but trusting Him. James has already highlighted the emphasis of this point in the earlier parts of this letter to pray in faith and not with doubt. Yielding to God, as we've already talked about. Bringing the situation to His feet and trusting His mighty hand and perfect plan to be done. There seems to be, though, an assurance that if the elders pray in faith, that the person will be saved, will be healed, will be raised up, like it's a guarantee. And so it's good for us to slow and say, is that what this is promising? One thing we do know from Scripture is that all the believing, all those who have trusted their lives to Christ, will be raised up on the last day, will be given new bodies, untainted from sin and decay and death. It's good news, amen? This is an eternal hope and promise that brings believers much peace in the midst of long-suffering or ailment for some lifelong ailment. That said, James is referencing something more immediate and not that. While that is a good hope and promise we hold to, before I talk about what James is saying here, we have to do business with what he is not saying. Because this is a very manipulated text used by false teachers as a proof text to say something it's not. Some have done a lot of damage in teaching or believing that this says, if you just have enough faith... Your sickness will be healed and your loved one will be healed. This view puts the power to save and or to heal in the quantity of your faith and not in God's hands. Do you see that? This is a dangerous thing and not what this is saying. Many who have latched on to such a belief have prayed with this in mind and then when the person is not healed as they expected them to be, They've gone on to throw away their faith, to live a bitter life, in that they thought that they failed. They didn't have enough faith. They were lacking in faith. Or that God failed them in not doing what the verse seems to guarantee He would do. Maybe you've even lived there before or know someone who's had great falling out due to a misunderstanding of these kinds of texts in the Scriptures. This is so dangerous. To think this way is to put God in our debt. Like he's the genie in the lamp and I'm the keeper of the lamp. And he just does my bidding. Because I asked for it, he must deliver it. Who is in charge of how the world works if this is the case? We are. But that's not how the world works. God is not our genie in the sky. God is not obligated to do anything for us. He has already given us far more than we deserve in that we belong to Him through Christ. The faith that is exercised in prayer is faith or trust in God that He will accomplish His perfect will every day time that's praying in faith you're trusting him your faith is in him when we pray for another who is suffering or sick or dying we pray with all the confidence that God is able to heal and restore anything he chooses I don't care how bad it is 
that the doctor has proclaimed in the situation or that what you see before you. Church, pray in total faith in a God who created all things with a word. That he could not, that he can do whatever he wants to do in this situation. Faith that is exercised in prayer or trust in God that he will accomplish his perfect will every time. The author of Hebrews highlights this in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Church, we are to pray about everything and anything. God is ever present in all of our thoughts and life's moments. So why would we not pray about everything and anything? Have you ever become guilty of you get caught up in sin and you know you're right in the middle of it? Lustful thought, angry attitude or words, disobedience to the word. And your flesh says, Oh no, let's not pray to God right now. I'm in bad shape. Right? I mean, my thoughts are wicked right now. Or or this this situation is terrible. Do you you see the, the lie of the enemy in that? To keep you from going to the one by whom you should run to? To be convicted by? To be helped by? There is nothing you're ever in the middle of by which you should not pray. We should do this often and full of faith. The key is that we are praying in faith. Faith means we're trusting Him. We're trusting it to His perfect will. We're not demanding things of God. We have no place to speak to him this way. We are bringing life situations before him in faith, looking to trust him and join him in what he's going to do or not do. We want his will, not ours. In a larger teaching of prayer, the scriptures say to bring your request before God, whatever it is. But it also says we are to yield to him. So share what's on your heart. Don't hold that back. Pray in accordance with his will. Ask for it. Healing, fighting a sin, help, all good stuff. Ask for it. Don't hold that back. But always finish those prayers or include in those prayers true yielding to God. Your will be done, not mine. I would be a fool to say that somehow my will in this moment is better than yours. A person of faith does not want that or think that way. I'm going to trust you. I want your will. As good as this thing is that I just prayed for, my daughter is bleeding out before me. Save her, God. Yet not my will, but your will be done. Why? Why do you need to say that? Because maybe that is her appointed time. Sovereign God has numbered her days before they began, right? So is it right that I would plead with God to heal and to save my beloved daughter? Yes! And is it also right that I would ready myself, I would set myself in his grip to say, God, your will be done. That's what I want more than my will. Get me in that. Ready me for that. Our will is so limited. It is selfish and grossly imperfect. So when James says, prayer of faith will produce healing or saving or the person will be lifted up. It is the same confidence and or assurance that Jesus speaks of in many other passages. Do you see that this is not this, what seems like a guarantee here is not, this isn't a unique way of speaking of this. This is all over scripture. Let's just look at how Jesus himself speaks of prayer. John 14, 13. Whatever you ask in my my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. 
This I will do. That seems pretty sure. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Matthew 21, 22, whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. John 15, 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. That seems to be a lot of strong talk about asking, you'll get it. I'll really enjoy a red Ferrari, Lord. I will, I will use it for your kingdom. A surface reading of these teachings of Jesus seem to say, if you name it, and it's got some good God will attached to it, he'll deliver it. Name it and claim it is what the manipulation has taught. There are multi-billion dollar organizations who make buckets of money selling this ideology and false understanding of these texts. I just say, what happens when the person is not healed? Or the thing you prayed for doesn't come about? If you hold to a name it and claim it view, then your faith is wrecked. Then God failed you. But God doesn't fail. Amen? He is perfect in all of his ways. What all of these are saying is when we pray in faith, when we trust it to God, God will do his perfect will every time. Pray according to my will and my will will be done is a way to think about this. The scriptures even show us that it's not God's will that everyone who prayed for healing received it. Paul, one of the great leaders of the early church, prayed, Lord, heal me from this thorn in my flesh. He prayed three times and the Lord did not. The Lord willed that it would remain. To pray confidently in Jesus' name means it happens I'm sorry, doesn't mean it happens the way you asked for it or want it to happen. It means in praying in faith, you are trusting it to him and he will do what his perfect will is every time for his eternal name and your eternal good. Praying in the name of Jesus is praying in the confidence of the power of God to do the perfect work of God. Again, see prayer. We get hung up on this because we see prayer too much as a, I use this to get God to do what I want. And it is so much more about joining Him in what He's going to do. Which we need constantly that reorientation and reminder that He is who He is and that we're going to trust Him. And that he's good and worthy to be trusted. Oh, how we need to walk in faith and not by sight. We want God's will. We know his will will be done. We trust him. We truly trust him if we're full of faith. This is our faith at work, church. This is the power of God at work in us. This is James' point. In James 1, 6, let him ask in faith. When James says ask in faith, he means ask with confidence in God. It's only in faith by which we will want to and can know and trust God. He's saying put your faith to work in prayer. Faith is believing that God hears you. He loves you and has a perfect plan for you. And you trust him with it. Our faith is at work in trusting God, clinging to God, standing fast on his promises, despite the troubles we face, the pain that 
we're in the middle of, the, the ways the storm is raging in our lives. Do you do this? Do you walk by faith and not by sight, even when it's really hard? Do we honor God's word, even though our flesh wants something different? To put that off and say, I'm going to walk by faith, I'm going to trust you. Yielding to your perfect will, Lord. In Paul's letters to the Ephesians, he makes the same point of clarity and warning saying that the shepherd's job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. In Ephesians 4, 13 through 14, he continues, until we will attain the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes oh we must be mindful that manipulations are all around the word says that they'll rise up even from among us people we once thought we would lean on hard and heavy end up turning to the things of the world and agendas of the world we must continue to come back to scripture again and again to stand fast in unity, to let plurality do its work. The elders and I and many of our disciples that are running close with us this week are celebrating fellow brother in Christ, John MacArthur, pastor in Southern California, as he celebrates this week in his 50th year of ministry at the same church. That the unity of the faith means way less division than happens in this come and go culture that we're in. That we remain biblical. I want to grow old with you. I want to do many of your funerals. And I want to hold many of your grandbabies. And pass this legacy on to those who are coming behind us. Amen? May it be God's will. Church, understand this. When God is not trusted and we don't walk in unity, we will turn to lies, we will turn to man-made schemes to carry us along, and we will be undone. We will flounder and stray. Oh, that let us walk by faith in the unity of faith, maturing together, growing all the more met with our greeting team this morning and just encouraged them in the simplest of jobs in receiving you and welcoming you and loving you as you come in each week. To encourage them even to say, to never be done asking each other or leaders, hey, help me, help me get better, help me grow, help me see what I don't see, that we'd remain humble, that we'd constantly be inviting in. This would be a practice of all of us. To wrap up this morning, look at this last part of verse 15. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Church in Christ, know that you are forgiven. Colossians 1, 13 through 14. He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption. We have forgiveness of sins. Amen? When James says, if you've committed sins, you will be forgiven. This is true. In Christ, all your sin, past, present, and future, is forgiven. Any sin you may have got caught up in that might be due to your lowliness or your sickness is causing suffering, it's forgiven in Christ. We know this by faith, faith in Jesus, perfect atonement on our behalf, faith that it is finished. If you are here today and you have not trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, the call of Scripture on you is to repent of your sin, to confess it as sin, and to put your faith in Jesus alone for salvation. 
you would die yourself and live for him. That you would be born again, adopted into his family, and that you would walk with us together in unity until God calls us home. Church, may our faith be at work in prayer. I look forward to part two next week. I pray you'll be with us. In the meantime, let's praise God together with one last song as we go. Will you stand with me? I'm going to pray and the band's going to lead us as we exalt his holy and glorious name. Father, I thank you for this time that you've given us together in your good word. You are a good God. What a joy it is to be entrusted with your revelation that we do not have to uh, <clears throat> search and, and second guess, but that you've made it clear. You've endured your holy word that we would be captive to it. We'd be submitting to it joyfully. We would be repenting of, of sin that we have been shown and to see that as you're, you loving us, to not leave us where we are, but to, to take us forward and to grow us and to mature us. Thank you, Lord. It's all for you. All of this, all of us is for you. The glory is yours. And so we rally in unity today to sing of these truths. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.